Hi, I'm Randall from Randall's ESL Cyber Listening Lab, providing tips on language learning, culture, and human development. And I think one of the things that I have learned, I think slowly and incrementally, is the power of ideas on how we have the responsibility to influence and build healthy families, schools, local and global communities where people can grow and not only grow, but flourish. And I think communities, this happens when communities uh, are founded on a healthy dose of friendship and compassion. And when you have those two elements, almost anything can happen. Well, as part of this process of growth and learning, I think teachers, students, and other professionals around the world will have opportunities to share their ideas of all kinds, whether it's in a casual conversation at lunch or to an online audience like today. And whatever the case is, I think the sharing of ideas is founded on number one, understanding your audience, number two, organizing your content, and the last thing is preparing your presentation and executing your presentation as well. And so whatever those type of ideas that you're sharing now, no matter what type of presentation, this is what we're focusing on today is creating engaging presentations. And my guest today and I will be focusing not only on high resource environments where you have all of these technologies, but we also want to hear from you out there that are dealing and working and living and studying in low resource environments where, you know, having an internet and a reliable internet connect, connection is often a roadblock to doing anything. And that can be a real struggle. So what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to bring on my guest uh, to the broadcast today. So uh, welcome Mesa to our broadcast today on creating engaging presentations. So, Good morning. Uh, so let's go ahead, Mesa, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit to the audience so we know about you. I know that you and I met uh, over a year ago when you participated in a broadcast on, on uh, uh, the qualities of effective language teachers. So for our audience, could you just briefly introduce yourself? Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maysa Adnan. I am from Syria. Uh, right now, I'm presenting from the United Arab Emirates. Um, I'm going to tell you something about the United Arab Emirates since I'm living uh, uh, here. Uh, I have been living in the United Arab Emirates since 1996, and I have been teaching in the United Arab Emirates since 2003. Uh, the, um, I'm going to say also something about the community in the United Arab Emirates. People are very friendly uh, in this uh, country and uh, the, I can describe the community in the United Arab Emirates as being a multicultural community, which means that there are more than one nationality living here. Um, uh, all people can speak English here, even uh, so, so if you want to visit the United Arab Emirates, no need to learn Arabic or to learn any other language. You can just communicate with people in English because everybody can speak with English very well. Um, I'm going also to tell you something about the maybe the vast majority of the audience are teachers. That's why I'm going to also speak about the learning system. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, all our schools uh, started to change into the hybrid and online learning. And I think uh, it worked very well with us in the United Arab Emirates because students are uh, uh, are already uh, prepared to to the um, to using the online uh, learning. We have uh, even used the online learning um, even before the the uh, the pandemic started. So when the pandemic started, I think students were. Uh, uh, prepared for using the online learning. So it wasn't that much uh, difficult for them. The only problem I think was for some teachers because you know that we need to get used to new technologies, to use um, different uh, websites, different programs in order to present the lessons and also in order to make the tasks and to prepare the, uh, the uh, uh, quizzes and uh, exams. Uh, but I think um, it was a successful um, we can say successful uh, experience for everyone in the United Arab Emirates. Great. And I know that Mesa today, we're going to be talking about high resource, low resource environments. As I've mentioned before, sometimes if someone is watching a presentation and they don't have all of those technologies, they might do this. Uh, goodbye. 
<laughs> in other words, sometimes people want to make sure that we're going to be sharing ideas that are related to them. And I think that's what we're going to do, certainly as part of a presentation. Oh, just so you know, Mona says hello to you from uh, Tunisia. So it's great to have colleagues that we've met before in different situations. Also, I think you were going to, if you don't mind mentioning a little bit about the Dubai yes. Expo. And I think this is in many ways yes. connected to our topic today. Exactly. You know that the United Arab Emirates consists of seven main Emirates and uh, the uh, one of them is Dubai. And I think Dubai uh, has a kind of world fame because it's very famous for its uh, highest man-made building, which is uh, uh, Burj Khalifa. And I think uh, that it, uh, it attracts the attention of a lot of uh, tourists from uh, all parts of the world. Now, the other event that Dubai is going to host uh, uh, maybe uh, two months from now uh, is the uh, Dubai Expo. Now, for, for this event, I think um, it's going to start by the 1st of October and it will uh, going to go on uh, until the end of March. And here is an um, invitation to, to everybody uh, to visit Dubai in this uh, time and enjoy the beauty of the, the um, uh, Dubai Expo because they prepared a lot of lovely activities and even you, you can just enjoy watching the architectural design because they built a really massive and huge uh, city, we can say a whole city uh, to host this event. Okay, and I think once at people start to realize what our presentation is about today, they will see the connection because when you're talking about an expo, you're talking about people who are showcasing their work, sharing their ideas, connecting with a global audience. And as we talk about creating engaging presentation today, that is our hope as well. Uh, just so you can see, again, uh, Mona is saying hello. Uh, also, Leila from Tunisia is saying hello to you as well. So thank you very much. And as always, you know, Mesa, we're really encouraging teachers and students to be sharing their ideas on the topic today. And so what I want to do is just give an overview of what we're going to be covering and then we're going to jump into specific ideas. So what we're going to do today, again, the topic is creating, engaging, and effective presentations. Whether you're cre creating those with PowerPoint, with Prezi, with Google Slides, or, and I know one of our uh, guests today, or, or uh, those that are watching, I know Mona has created a number of presentations with poster board so whatever the type of presentation you're doing, we're hoping that these ideas will be relevant to you. We'll talk about common problems or concerns with any type of presentation. We'll talk about the types of presentations that teachers can give. Uh, we'll briefly talk about presentation a software and applications and the things that we're mentioning today will be found in the show notes. So if you're look, if you're watching on Facebook right now, you should be able to see some of the resources that we're going to mention. We're also going to talk about choice of colors, whether they be in PowerPoint, whether they be in, in posters, we'll talk about uh, color vision deficiency, sometimes uh, with the audience, Sometimes people can't see particular colors. I think that's important. Sometimes we make the assumption that they can. Fonts and sizes, we're gonna talk about use of graphics, balancing of text and images as well. We'll talk about where to find different types of images. Uh, sometimes that can be an issue with copyright, uh, permission and so forth. Then at the end, we're gonna close out with presentation tips because you can have a wonderful presentation and it fails, it falls flat because you're lacking the actual ability to engage with your audience, which I think is so important as well. Does that sound okay, Mesa? Yes, I think yes, you presented everything that we are going to discuss today. Okay, well, let's just get right into uh, the actual presentation. First of all, uh, and again, for those that are watching, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your ideas. We're gonna talk about how teachers, students, and other professionals like the people that hopefully, Mesa, the people that are participating in the Dubai Expo are watching our presentation today because I'm oh, hopefully lovely. their ideas, <laughs> our ideas will help them. Uh, we're going to talk about creating engaging presentations. Again, not just online, but in the classroom as well. Organizing your content, designing the appearance of the 
content, and then polishing the delivery of your ideas is what we're going to be doing as well. So let's go ahead and get right into that, Mesa. Uh, briefly, we're going to talk about some common problems. Those that are watching might say, I've never had that problem. But I think, Mesa, you and I would agree we probably have had some of these problems together. Exactly. Okay, now I think the the, uh, the most common uh, problem is the internet connection because the, the if the, the internet connection is not good enough, I think everything will be not okay with the presentation, even if you prepare it in a good way. If the internet connection is not good, everything will be lost. Uh, so I think we have to make sure of the internet connection. Also, um, I think it's better to, to discuss other issues with the other slides or do yeah, you like to speak I about could, them, Brenda? If I could just jump in when you are mentioned, let's, we're going to talk about some of those others. When we're talking about presentation and the internet, sometimes I think this happens, including myself, I do this. The ideas that I'm sharing are only designed for those people that have high internet connections. But we know, and I'm assuming in the United Arab Emirates, I know I've heard from teachers that have spoken about the issue in Tunisia, in South America, in Nepal, where in the same classroom, some students have good internet connections, but other students might live in more rural areas where the connection is not as strong. So thank you for bringing that point right up. Uh, what we're going to do is briefly, just for those that are watching, we're going to briefly mention some of these, and then we're, we're going to weave these ideas into our uh, discussion today. Uh, too much text on a slide uh, you know, for example, people are reading the slides. I think that's common that we find uh, too much flashy elements. I know, Mesa, you're going to be speaking about that as well. Yes. And too many slides. It's like, I have a presentation. I have 10 minutes per to present, and I have 327 slides. Uh, just too many. Uh, we're going to be talking. So those first three, and again, we're going to be talking more in detail about these. And then the other thing is about actual delivery of not connecting with your audience, the uh, inability to adapt to the uh, audience in real time. For example, you notice part of your audience is not paying attention for whatever reason. And then sometimes selecting words beyond our linguistic reach, like I really want to sound professional and I select a $10,000 word, and the audience doesn't understand it as well. Exactly. And Randall, this leads me to something important. That's why we have to know our audience from the very beginning. Before we prepare our presentation, we need to know our audience. Whom are we uh, going to speak with? Whom are we going to present the, the or to uh, prepare the presentation for? We have to know our audience. It's very important. And I think it's the first step in preparing for any presentation. And I think it's really good because even when we're looking at our audience, I know Nezreem from the United States, she's just joined us. Leila is from Tunisia. Mona is from Tunisia. We have people from Colombia, from Brazil, from Vietnam. So you're absolutely right about knowing your audience. Could you speak a little bit more to that idea? Okay. Now, knowing your audience means that you have to know your students. You know that presentations can be done for two reasons, either for the work, if you are working in a company or in an organization, you might be asked to prepare a kind of presentation to be presented in front of your uh, boss, in front of your uh, principal, or in front of your colleagues. Uh, the other kind of presentations might be done in front of your students. So we have different types of presentations. Now, knowing your audience means that you have to know their background. You have to know their culture. Even their culture matters a lot because you might present something that might be appropriate in your uh, culture, but might not be uh, might might be uh, might not be good in other cultures. So that's why you have to be very careful in choosing the images, in choosing even the content of your presentation. Um, also, I think we, we can speak about the uh, color uh, vision uh, deficiency also. You have to know if your audience might have any kind of disability or color blindness or anything related to problems with their uh, sight. So you have to know and you have to identify your audience. You have to know them so that you can help them know uh, and uh, make use of your presentation. 
And I think that's really important when we're talking about audience. You talked about specifically with students, understanding uh, their background, their cultural background, their language background. And I know what happens in my classes is that sometimes students who are preparing presentations for other students find information on the internet that was designed for a native speaking audience where the their audience in the classroom are students, their own peers, that uh, sometimes they select words that are beyond the linguistic reach. And it's kind of like today, right now, just so you know, I'm trying to be mindful in the moment of every word, perhaps I think too much about my audience. For example, I have uh, someone else that has joined from Peru. So keeping in mind, you mentioned the cultural appropriateness of images, of text, of ideas that I think are really uh, critical to selecting uh, content. And that's what you were talking about, knowing your audience and their backgrounds. Exactly. It's very important to know your audience, as I said, because if they they uh, do not accept one idea, they might not continue with you, especially if you are making it in front of or, or to, to your work uh, colleagues. They might not be interested if you mention something that might cause some kind of uh, harm for them or anything that is not appropriate in their culture. So that's why it's important to know the audience. Yeah, and the other thing is, I when I think about this as well, when I think about the audience, because I we know several of these people that are watching the broadcast today. For me, if I'm watching a broadcast and it's content that I already know, that I fully am aware of, then I might just move on to something else. Uh, so it's kind of, as we were preparing our presentation today, we were trying to think of a balance of teachers, of, of students, of people of different ability levels and so forth, who are part of that audience, because we will always want to retain that audience as well. So let's go ahead now, Mesa, we were talking about organizing your content. Let's talk about identifying the purpose of your presentation. Why would that be relevant? Okay, now, as I said, we have two types of presentations, those that are done for the work purpose and those that are done for uh, the school and for teaching uh, uh, purpose. Now, for the uh, work um, for the work uh, presentations, uh, there are certain tips that should be followed uh, for the work presentations. Um, as I said, they are going to be uh, presented in front of your colleagues uh, at work, or um, in order to uh, to clarify some ideas, or um, uh, if you if you just want to share something with your uh, with your colleagues at work you can you can make a presentation now there are as i said there are certain tips for the for making it a successful presentation uh, these tips um, we and, can say and we're we're talking about several different i'm sorry i'm jumping here uh, about work presentations is that yes. correct Yes, exactly. Okay. So for the work presentations, there are several things that should be taken into consideration. For the first tip is that you have to simplify it, make it as simple as possible. Now, what I mean by simple is that it should be even simple in design. Don't use a lot of images and don't use a lot of colors. Don't use a lot of decorations while you are making a professional presentation. It should be very simple. Why? Because if you are using a lot of images and if you are using a lot of uh, colors, uh, you might distract your audience. They might be distracted from the main purpose of your presentation. You know that work presentations are focusing a lot on specific ideas. So if you are using a lot of animated photos or if you are using sound effects or the uh, movement effect, you know that sometimes we can use these uh, effects to, to, to make the slide move very slowly or you like know an that animation or something like exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. So that's why we have to avoid all of these things. Now, uh, also, yes. Just so yes, you know, yes. I think Layla from Tunisia was reading our mind. She was reading your mind. She says the most important thing to do in a presentation is to simplify the content to reach the largest number of your audience. Exactly. I, yes. Exactly. Okay. And uh, Mike says, I can't agree more. So the idea of keeping uh, the presentation really simple and so forth. Now, let me ask you, and again, I'm interested in hearing about the audience, uh, from the audience. Why is it that instead of keeping things simple, why do people add additional animations and pictures? What leads us to do that? 
psychologically, what are people thinking when they're adding those images? No, I think maybe, maybe they want to attract the audience's attention. It could be, or they want them to feel, or not to feel uh, any kind of boredom, because you know that if you uh, see a lot of things moving in front of uh, uh, you while you are watching something, you might be, you, you might not feel any kind of boredom. But for the work presentation, avoid all of these things, because you will distract your audience completely from the main purpose of your presentation. You want them to focus on your ideas. You want them to focus on something specific. So if they uh, see a lot of movements, a lot of sound effects, a lot of um, um, uh, animated uh, slides, I think they will be distracted. And this is not professional at all. You can use, you can use them just in one slide. It's fine, but not in every slide. It's kind of like even today, Mesa, as I was getting ready for the presentation, I was thinking, what tie do I wear? You know, sometimes it doesn't matter, but sometimes even a tie and what you wear and how you design things can be distracting. You might think it is drawing attention and it is exactly often to the wrong thing. Uh, so I think that's really an excellent point of ta talking about uh, keeping it simple. Uh, what else can we speak on this idea of keeping it simple and then yes. using images? Yes, using high quality images. Uh, if you if you are using images, if or if you want to use images, as I said, avoid using the animated ones. If you want to use images, you know that sometimes you might use any image from the internet, but you have to take into consideration that some or the vast majority of images on the internet are copy uh, uh, have the the copyright. So, which means that you cannot use them. Uh, you cannot use them without being or without permission. Um, I will, um, the, the Unsplash is a website that is, that provides the uh, uh, people with a lot of images and these images are of high quality. They are high quality images and you, you can use them without being or without, uh, they do not have copyright or uh, they, they have copyright, sorry, they have copyright, but you will, they, they, you will not be asked why, why you use them without permission. Uh, the, the website allows you to use them uh, anytime you want. And I think, Mesa, you're making an excellent point. And I can see that you are very experienced in this area of not only in your own presentations, but educating your students on the issues of, of legally using images that have been provided by authors, by, by content creators. But again, as you mentioned, you mentioned Unsplash, there's Pexels, there's Pixabay. And anytime you use images, you want to make sure, uh, can they be used, you know, uh, in presentations? Can they be used for educational use? Can they be used for commercial use? Exactly. Uh, do I have to use an attribution to the actual use of it? So I, I, I can't underemphasize, I can't overemphasize the idea of what you're saying right now with the use of images and where you find them, because you just can't go out and grab something uh, because it does belong to someone. Yes, I think it doesn't matter if you are using it at school because nobody will see it except your students. But if you are presenting like us now, we are presenting online and everyone can see it. That's why we have to be very, very careful while choosing the images that we are using in the, uh, in the broadcast. All right. So let's take a look at some comments that are coming up because we're going to be talking about some other issues with fonts and colors and so forth. Um, uh, Mike said the best way to keep audience focus is by keeping it simple. All right. Absolutely. Uh, Mike also says, and please, Mike, let us know. I don't, I don't know if we caught where you're uh, uh, joining us from. Uh, too many animations and fonts of all kinds and fanciness can cause distraction. That's what we are uh, talking about. Uh, maybe it really works for kids. And I'm not sure if it really works for kids, meaning maybe, as you mentioned, Mesa, maybe certain animations can work for kids. Yes. Now, uh, we are going to talk about that when we move to the uh, school presentations. Okay. Good. Areem says, I don't agree. From my experience, colors and animated pictures do motivate pupils and make them more interested, especially when you introduce games for assessment like a hoot. In the presentation, uh, if the presentation is plain and simple, pupils will get uh, will get bored. 
Um, and I think Mesa, both of us agree with Reem is that yes, it's that balance. Uh, I know uh, I've used Kahoot with my students as well. And yeah, animation can be a vital part of some of those elements. So Reem, thank you for sharing your opinion on that. I think that is very valid in certain situations. And yeah, without anything, knowing your audience, it could get boring as well. Uh, also, Layla from Tunisia says, when you seem respectful and serious without losing your smile, you can attract your audience. Uh, maybe, maybe when you're respectful, you can attract your audience. I don't know, maybe being too serious, depending on the nature of the presentation, you might lose your audience. But I think, uh, certainly, I think what we're talking about right from the beginning today, Mesa, is knowing your audience. Your knowing audience, your yes. audience. Uh, exactly. And and again, thank you. Elaine from Bolivia uh, from Brazil is joining us as well. So again, keep sharing these ideas because Mesa, you and I agree it could depend on the audience uh, to yes, what and we're... it also depends on the uh, topic that you want even even if for the, the work uh, uh, for the work presentations, as Reem said, we can we can make it animated we can make it with colors we can but it depends on the topic that you are discussing because as i said i expect that the vast majority of work presentations are somehow dealing with a specific or with um, we can say serious issues so th they are not done for games or for uh, entertainment and for these issues and, and most likely they are going to be um, uh, for for professional issues and and i agree with that and I also agree with the idea that there are many people out there that are creating presentations for children. I've had a number of people say to me in some of the broadcasts, well, how does this apply for teachers working with children? So it's that balance. And certainly we would be interested, Mesa, in hearing from any teachers working with children or long, younger learners where, well, in this particular audience, uh, it might uh, work this way. And again, I wanna remind our audience, First of all, you're talking about presentations for professionals, maybe other teachers, where we're also going to talk about presentations for younger learners. Um, some other comments that have uh, come in. Uh, Hamda said, it depends on the content and the interest. I agree with that. Uh, Enos is joining us from Tunisia. Thank you, Enos, for joining. Um, another was presentation differs teaching. So if you're Preparing slides for teaching, it could be simple and its contents must have many activities for the students. So once again, if we're like today, our presentation, Mesa, is limited pretty much to text because of our audience. But if we're dealing with students and so forth, that might be a little bit different. Yes, exactly. And this is what we are going to discuss in the coming uh, slide. Yep. So let's let's go let's go ahead and move on to that right now. Uh, great comments. Thank you everyone for sharing because sometimes I lack the experience that many of you are going through because you're working with so many different people in so many different environments. So uh, before we go on, let's talk about color and font because okay. I think that can be really important. And then we'll talk about uh, classroom presentations versus work presentations. Okay, now, uh, as I said, the colors for the work presentations th should be very, um, we can say calm colors. They shouldn't be very bright. Notice that, and also, also remember that the, the whole slides, all slides should be the same color. Try to make them all the same color, uh, color while you are designing your presentation. If it's done for the uh, work, uh, for the work uh, presentation. Uh, also, um, I will talk about uh, the, um, uh, using yes, it's very important to use the um, we can say yes contrasting colors. You know that sometimes the people might use um, the background to be very very dark, um, or the the background is very uh, light, and they are using the the color of the font that they are using will be very um, uh, very dark. So the uh, the the pe people will not be able to see the what is written on the slide? That's why try to make the background very uh, light with light colors like I'm using now. Notice that I'm using the uh, white background and I'm using the, uh, the blue and the black colors 
or font. So this will make a kind of contrast so that the writing or what is written on the slide will be very visible or will be seen uh, in a good way to the uh, readers or to the audience who are watching the presentation. So uh, color contrast plays an important issue while we are designing the, the uh, presentation. Uh, and for, I think uh, that's, instance, I think those are excellent yeah. points. Number one, font and sizes. Because sometimes when people pre prepare a presentation, they don't actually view their presentation on different sizes of screens exactly. and devices. Exactly. So right now, and I would be interested if how many of you that are watching the presentation are watching it on a mobile device, because if you're watching this broadcast on a mobile device, and I'm sure many of you might be, is that the sound, the, the sizes are so small that you might not be able to see it. And, yes, and I exactly. think that's really important. And it happened with me, uh, maybe at the end of the school year, one of our colleagues was presenting, was making a kind of presentation for the school purpose. And unfortunately, he, he, he wasn't, um, um, he, he was using very small font. Even with the huge screen, we were unable, even those who are sitting in the front seats were unable to see. And uh, I was obliged to take photos for every slide and use my mobile, maximize the, uh, the, the uh, photo so that I can see what is written. So he, he didn't notice that he used the, uh, the wrong font. So the font size is very also vital. Make sure of the font size. Uh, size. And you have also to, make, uh, to, to take into consideration that maybe some people are having some kind of problems. They might be visually impaired. So you have to take into consideration all of these issues if you want your presentation to be a successful one. And that's one of the things that we're talking about, color vision deficiency. Uh, yes. Often in the past, it was referred to partial color blindness. But a lot of times I work with a colleague and he is unable to see certain colors. So when we create presentations, he, he might gently remind me or in the presentation, I might ask him in the preparation, what colors stand out to you? And so that's one of the, the actual challenges. And I don't think people realize, just so you know, uh, Mesa, as we're presenting right now, you're looking over to your left uh, on your computer screen to follow. And it's just yes. because right now, just so that people know, you're broadcasting off your smartphone. And so even then, I have to always remind myself uh, with the people that are joining me on a broadcast like this or people who are watching with a phone, the sizes uh, of the screen, the actual font sizes, the font colors, which I think are very important. So thanks exactly. for bringing those up. Yes, that's um, why I'm using my laptop in order to read what is written on the, the slides <laughs> because it, it's bigger than what, uh, what I can see on the uh, mobile. Right. Okay. Well, let's now go on to, and again, thank you everyone for sharing some thoughts. We would like to, as we're going through the broadcast, feel free to share any of the technologies that you use, any website services that you use, uh, classroom presentations that don't use PowerPoint or Google Slides. What kinds of presentations are you doing uh, in your classes? Please share as we're talking about uh, this next point. So we talked about work presentations. Let's talk about classroom presentations and how some of those ideas might be similar or different. Okay, now classroom presentations can be also, they, they can uh, have different types. Um, notice that I wrote at the end of this slide that uh, uh, recommended only for students between 5 to 13. So these cannot be applied to high school students or students starting from grade 9 and above because we have to follow the procedures taken for the professional presentation or for the work presentation. Now notice that for, for the younger ages, we can make the slides more catchy. They can be catchy. They can have uh, bright colors. We can use animated photos. But my advice is not to depend all the time on the animated photos. Because sometimes if you have poor internet connection, your presentation might not work well. Because you know that they might not work properly. And you might be disappointed. So 
if you want to use animated uh, slides, use only one slide so that you can make sure uh, of your internet connection. Uh, uh, so, and then you can use the, in your next presentation, you can use the animated photos. Uh, now, if I could jump in here, Mesa, real quickly. This actually goes back to the earlier comment by Reem, says, my experience, colors and animated pictures do motivate. That's what you're saying. Yes, That's exactly, what you're suggesting. Exactly. It depends on the age of the students that you are yeah. teaching. Yes, now, we can I use colors. Just, you know, we can I use... Yeah, I, you know, you mentioned recommended between 5 and 13. I think there could be some leeway as, you know, I don't think it's a, a hard cut off at 13 or 14, but just knowing your audience, I think is Yes, important. exactly. Uh, the, why, why I'm saying this, because it happened with me, uh, with my students. As I told you, I'm teaching high school students. So uh, I used once uh, animations and I used uh, a lot of images, uh, animated uh, photos, and I used also the sound effects. So my students uh, did, didn't like it. They said that, teacher, you are dealing with us as if we were kids. We are not kids. So they, they rejected this. So that's why I'm saying uh, make, make it as a professional if you are teaching students from grade nine and above because they will not accept it. This is from my own experience. Maybe for other teachers, they might they might like the, the, the same way that uh, they can see on the slide. I mean, uh, they, they might prefer to use catchy images, uh, bright colors. Um, uh, they, they might like to, to use the sound effects and the... Uh, th those transitions from one slide to another, you know that there are a lot of things on the PowerPoint. Yeah. And um, um, also the colors and the font, they can be applied in the same way, but you can make them um, bigger. Bigger and you can use more bright colors because you know that students at the early age can distinguish the, the font size no matter how small uh, it is. And also I think they, there are some kinds of fonts where the letters can jump and bounce you can use these uh, things because you know that you want to attract the attention of your students in this early age of uh, of school. But yeah, and I certainly I, said, I think what we're we're trying to do is we're validating uh, those teachers that are working with a diverse population of students from very young learners to adult learners. Uh, certainly, those can be really important. And it, this is kind of what you've been talking. Reem said, and thank you. Yes, the size. And Reem, I'm not sure where you're from. Please let me know if you haven't indicated that already. I always like to recognize uh, who's participating. Uh, you said, yes, the size of the font is very important to instill the lesson because there are some learners who have visual memory. So maybe the idea of having different font sizes can allow students to, that idea to be imprinted on their mind, at least in short term, uh, I like that idea of using a variety of fonts for that particular purpose. I think that's great. Exactly. So let's go on, uh, talk about, you talked a little bit about animated photos. Anything more on colors and font? No, the colors and fonts, as I said, we can, we can be, we can be uh, somehow, uh, we, we have to use the suitable, um, the suitable colors. We have to use... But what is applied to the uh, work presentation can be applied to the school presentations. Because as I said, some, some people might be visually impaired. We might have some students with blind, uh, with the color uh, vision def uh, deficiency. So that's why we, we have to ask about the background of our students. And I think at the beginning of the school year, all the school administrations will provide their teachers with a list of uh, the names of students who uh, have any kind of these problems. So most likely teachers are going to know their students and they can design their, uh, their presentations depending on their students. And what is interesting, Randall, uh, is that there is a website in which you can provide uh, the you, you can provide the presentation that you are going to, to do in front of your audience. You can provide them with the link to your presentation so that they can use a specific link that changes the colors in your presentation into the colors that are suitable for their um, color blindness or uh, color vision deficiency. And this is really interesting. And I tried it on my laptop. I think I'm going to share the link with um, uh, on Facebook later because I think I didn't 
um, download the, the link to the to this presentation. But it and works. I tried it. It's really interesting because I tried it. You can change all the colors. You can choose the color that you uh, you cannot see properly. Or uh, we ha we have variety of choices. So every person with the color vision deficiency can choose what is suitable for him or for her. I like that. I like that. It's, so it's if really you can. If Love you can send that link to me and then I'll add that to the show notes uh, on Facebook because a lot of people might say, oh, where is that website? Yeah, and so uh, I think I have already done, Randall. Okay, great. I uh, I send it to to Facebook to you privately. Great. So if you like to share it with uh, the audience. Yeah, I will it's do lovely, that. Really, because I tried it. I tried this link. Great, great to know. And keeping in mind with this, we've been talking and showing different slides and so forth. And I think it's interesting for people to know, number one, there's a lot of different online services, tools that can be used for creating presentations, not just for online use, but for classroom use. And what's interesting is you created this presentation on Canva Yes, exactly. And I'm and I'm displaying it using Google Slides. Um, Lovely. And so certainly there are a variety of a lot of people are using PowerPoint, but people are looking for other services that might be free or more universal. Canva, Prezi, Google Slides, Genially are some of those services. And if any of you are using other services, uh, please let us know. What other tools do you use for images? What other tools, as you mentioned? Um, Mesa about selecting colors, I think could be useful. And we still would be interested in hearing of classroom presentations with posters and other ideas that people are using too. So this is uh, really great. Uh, I want to tell teachers about Canva. Canva is very, very useful for teachers uh, because you know that we might be, or we might take too much time in order to prepare a PowerPoint presentation. What is lovely about Canva is that it provides you with as some kind of ready-made slides. All what you need to do is just to change the photos, to change the color. Even the triangle, if you see, uh, uh, let's go back to the um, to one of the slides in which I used a blue triangle, I think, the previous. Uh, so I like uh, that. E even, yes, even these triangles, you can change their position. You can change uh, them, you can flip them, you can make them upside down. You can also change the color of these uh, triangles so that uh, it will save the time of the teacher in, instead of uh, designing a lot of uh, things you can you can find ready-made things uh, of course there are different colors and different designs but I chose this because it's very simple and this is what I want to to tell the audience uh, be simple as much as you can so there are I variety so. of uh, templates on Canva and they will save the time of those who are uh, preparing present a lot of presentations it's really lovely Canva, Canva, yes. Canva <laughs> is a wonderful, I, I use Canva a lot. And so if there's one technical tip, te uh, 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 teaching tip today with technology, I probably would suggest that uh, Canva yes. is one tool to use. Yes, not, not so only that, for teachers, but also for those who are interested in designing things for the Instagram, for Facebook, for LinkedIn, you know that we can uh, we can design a lot of things by using Canva. Right. And um, uh, I don't know, Randall, if you uh, see my Instagram, I uh, designed a lot of things using Canva. It's really interesting. You can, because also you can add uh, music, you can add sound, you can add whatever you want. So it's really, uh, it saves a lot of time for those who are uh, using or working a lot on uh, designing things for their uh, social media websites. And right. also for those who are interested in business, they can... Uh, they can design the business cards. They can design a lot of things. So it's really wonderful uh, website. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, great. Uh, this has been wonderful, Mesa. And what we like to do, everyone, is we like to wrap up the broadcast today by talking about actually delivery tips. So we have a few minutes left, and I want to talk about tips on how to deliver a more effective presentation because you can have a wonderful presentation and yet it falls flat in the delivery or inadequacy or uh, of the delivery. And so we'd like to talk about that for the last few minutes. First of all, uh, these were some of the things that we've already mentioned about what to avoid. Animated slides in some situations, very bright backgrounds, uh, lots of writing because presenters tend to read, and then lots of images, images that overwhelm 
the presentation because sometimes I find uh, Mesa that sometimes my students spend, you know, it's kind of like they spend 90% of their time creating images and then they only spend 10% of the time designing yes. their actual words and content. So I think that's exactly. important. And, and sometimes, sometimes they, they, uh, uh, their presentation is not successful simply because they they wrote everything they want to discuss in their presentation on the slides. So they so they are just reading what is written on the slide. They are not discussing things. They are not analyzing them. And this is really one of the drawbacks of the uh, uh, presentations. So don't try uh, all the ideas that you want to say uh, in front of all your audience. Just try hints or titles so that you can remember what you want to discuss and analyze. Yeah, it's kind of like even today as we're presenting, if we had all of the ideas on all of the slides, people would just say, just give me a link and I'll download the presentation and look at it later. Exactly. So certainly yes. important. So let's let's kind of round up our fall, uh, uh, last ideas of delivering your ideas. Now, we could spend a whole presentation talking about this, but these are just some general ideas. Number one, as you create a presentation, make sure you practice with an audience and a timer. Sometimes people, I think I do this, is I practice in front of a mirror to make sure that, you know, my hair is correct and, and everything like this. But I think it's really important to have an audience. And if you're giving a group presentation, perhaps you can have, you know, if you have two other people in your presentation, or if they're not in your group, maybe just friends who actually sit out, if you're doing a face-to-face -face presentation, to where you're actually making sure you're connecting with your audience and using a timer. Like right now, I'm looking at our time and I'm thinking in my mind, we have a few minutes left. I wanna make sure that I smoothly make a transition to the end of our ideas. I think which is one really more thing, important. One more thing, Randall, sorry for interrupting you. No, also no. The background, the background and the location of the presentation, where are you presenting from the background? What, what do you want them to what, to, what what do you want your audience to see what you don't want them to see? So <laughs> It's kind of like, okay, if I expand my screen there, people can see, they can see a little bit about my background. If we expand yours, they can see a little bit. So I think that was a, a really important point there. Uh, pause and vary your delivery speed. I always have to remember that. Because if I'm coming up with a critical point, I want to pause and give the audience time to reflect, especially if there is second language learners, they're learning and they're just trying to, to process some of the ideas that I said, I think that are really important as well. Um, also, uh, some of the ideas that we talked about establishing eye contact with the entire audience, because one of the things that I found when I started to present teach years ago is I didn't look enough to the left. I often look to the center and to the right. And I think that can just being aware of your eye contact is. And the last thing is just maintaining good posture and presence throughout the presentation. Just so you know, Mesa, as we were pre pre uh, preparing, sometimes we get a little bit nervous. Sometimes exactly. I have to remind myself to slow down because I have a tendency to eat my words if I don't. And I think that's really important as well. Um, just a couple of last comments. Reem said uh, from Tunisia. Thank you, Reem. Simple presentations work with outstanding pupils or high achievers and those who use to learn through ICT and primary and preparatory uh, uh, education. So the idea of simple. And I think often for me is less is more, less is more. And don't let your the images and the text overshadow any of the ideas that you're trying to share. Exactly, because you know that a lot of images might be distracting to the audience. Absolutely. And uh, you also mentioned just a couple of things that we shared. Uh, Canva is the website that you mentioned that can create yes. business cards, presentations. It can ca create uh, thumbnails and PowerPoint presentations. And, and content, when you're also content for your social media websites, really, it, it will create very lovely and beautiful content. You can design whatever you want, uh, whether a post for the uh, Instagram or Facebook. You can also create a lot of things. So try to use Canva. It's really wonderful. 
And the other one you mentioned is Unsplash. Unsplash, Unsplash. is a, yes. a website where you can find images. I also mentioned Pixels and Pixabay. All of the references to these will be on the show notes for the broadcast as well. And uh, also, one, one more thing, Randall, sorry for interrupting you, about no. Unsplash. Uh, you can also, if you are interested in photography and you want to sell your photos, you can also uh, find a good place for selling your photos if you are interested. So it's not about only taking images for the presentations. You can also sell photos and you can display your, your uh, photos if you are interested in photography. And I know you like photography. Yes, I'm obsessed with photography. <laughs> and perhaps in the show notes or in Facebook, you can share your Instagram if, if you feel comfortable in doing so, because I think you have some wonderful pictures there. Thank you. Oh, uh, Leila mentioned Genali from Tunisia. Thank you. Again, is another wonderful platform that we can use to find, uh, to create presentations as well. Well, uh, Leila, it, uh, again, Leila, thank you for sharing. Uh, Mesa, thank you so much for joining the broadcast today, for sharing your expertise and your ideas. We certainly appreciate everyone that is joining. Uh, and we recognize that so many teachers are working in so many different environments, as we mentioned, high resource, low resource environments. But we hope that some of the general ideas that we shared today, some of the teaching ideas, the presentation ideas with fonts, with colors, with images have been helpful to you. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much. We want to wish you a wonderful day and an even better tomorrow. Take care and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Randall. I was really glad to be with you all. And thank you a lot for the audience. Thanks a lot. All right. Until the next.